Do fossil sequences support Darwinian evolution? Today, it's Ken Colson here from Creation Unfolding, and uh, we are back uh, today to look at this question, uh, fossil sequences, and do they support Darwinian evolution or not? And when it comes to evolution, really there is two main uh, pieces of evidence that are used to support that theory. One uh, is fossils, specifically sequences of fossils. And two is homology, and we're going to look at homology next. But these are the two big pieces of um, information or data that, that, that scientists use in order to support the theory of Darwinian evolution, fossils and homology. And with homology, I'm not just talking about uh, similarity of bone structure. I'm also talking about similarity of things like DNA and genes and things like that. These are the two major pieces of evidence. And so we're going to look at both of those. Uh, and, the, and we're going to look at fossil uh, sequences first. Now, uh, one of the fossil sequences that is really critical in the theory of uh, Darwinian evolution is the horse series. Well, we're not going to talk about it here because I did a whole video on it, so you can go back and watch that video. And in that video, we concluded uh, that the horse sequence is real. Um, and there are three ways to look at it, either one, uh, it's a sequence of diversification from Hyracotherium onto a modern horse. Uh, it is uh, a sequence composed of either two or three created horse kinds. And I'm fine with any of those positions. I particularly think that it's a, a full sequence, uh, at least from Mesohippus on, uh, and maybe even uh, including Hyracotherium. I don't think this is uh, can be used as evidence in support of Darwinian evolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, because at the end of the day, we're still left with a, a horse. Uh, I mean, it doesn't look like a traditional horse, a traditional equus, but you can still see that um, it was essentially, uh, the basics of that essential animal are still there. And so uh, I, don't, I don't think it uh, is, is a compelling argument for Darwinian evolution. I think creationists can really look at this uh, sequence and see it as post-flood uh, diversification. So that's the fossil horse sequence. Go back and watch the video uh, for information on that. All right. Uh, secondly, the second piece of uh, uh, the second fossil sequence really is the evolution of birds from theropod dinosaurs, and this one's uh, really important because it's it's out there in uh, the public. Uh, kids love dinosaurs because of Jurassic Arc uh, and, the, and multiple uh, movies from that franchise. People are really aware more of dinosaurs now, really in the last 20 years, than they ever have been. And uh, it's going to be very important for, uh, for parents to understand what is this evidence uh, of dinosaur evolution, where supposedly birds evolved from dinosaurs. They, they really need to be equipped and so this video hopefully will help equip parents on how to dialogue with their children if they're convinced that, uh, that birds evolved from dinosaurs. So this is a really, really important video for you parents who've got kids who are going to be asking those questions um, when they come home from school. Now, before we talk about this, the first thing we want to do is talk about feathers on dinosaurs. And, and the reason we need to talk about this is because in the last year or two, there's been quite a bit of discussion in creationist circles about whether or not uh, dinosaurs even had feathers. And uh, I think that this is a bad idea to believe that they didn't have feathers. The reason being, I don't think it's necessary. And uh, I think it's just a, uh, I think it's just a, an initial problem or a wall that's going to be put up uh, before we get to the actual problem, which is the evolution of birds from dinosaurs. In other words, we don't really need to defend the idea uh, uh, or oppose the idea that dinosaurs had feathers. We don't need to oppose it. There's nothing in the Bible against that concept. Uh, now, I do want to talk about it briefly because I think it, it's important, again, uh, 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 for you as parents or just in general for general knowledge uh, or students, if you're studying these things at college or university, 
uh, to be able to get a handle on this, uh, f uh, if, if you have uh, friends or family members, etc., that are questioning these things. So, um, first of all, it's important to note that the creationists that disagree, or the creationists that are saying that uh, dinosaurs did not have feathers, what they're not saying is that these um, these fossils, the feathers on the fossils, are fake. Now, it is true, there have been fakes, and there is a fake, a fake fossil trade in China, and so we've got to be careful. But uh, feathered dinosaurs have been found on other continents as well, so it's not just a Chinese thing. Uh, but we do have to be careful of that, but that's not what they're saying. Essentially, what they're saying is, look, the fossil is real, and the, the feathers are real, but we don't want to call it a dinosaur anymore, we want to call it a bird. And I'm going to really just briefly talk about that, why that just doesn't work. So here is a fossil of Microraptor, for example. And, and as far as I know, all creationists believe that Microraptor had feathers. Um, but what they want to do is, is they want to call this a bird. So Microraptor did have a nice plume of feathers. You can see, uh, looking at these feathers on this fossil, on its arms and legs, it's really, really nice, nice feathers on it. Uh, and also on its tail as well. And so this critter flew, everyone agrees. But you've got two groups in creationism, one saying it, it's, it's a dinosaur and the other saying it's a bird. Um, and we'll talk about that momentarily. The second uh, piece of fossil evidence I want to present is that of Anchiornis. This is a lifelike reconstruction, supposedly, of what it would look like. Uh, but again, you can see that nice plume of feathers in this fossil. And again, I don't think anyone's saying that the fossils are fake. What they're saying is that this is just a bird. It's not a dinosaur. And that's really, really important, okay, to get that down. That it's really, this this discussion in creationism is really about taxonomy or classification. Uh, which class, where do we put this uh, this organism it, it, when we group it? That's where uh, all the issues are. Okay, so to start off with, um, I want you to look at these five skeletons. And I want you to group them. So go ahead and pause the video. Uh, for a minute and go ahead and put these uh, skeletons into two groups. You don't have to know what they are, although you probably do, but go ahead and put them into a couple of groups. So go ahead and pause the video and do that. Okay, now more than likely what you did is this. You put uh, these two skeletons in this group and you put these three skeletons in this group. And the reason you did that is because these two skeletons obviously are very, very similar to each other and these three skeletons seem to be similar with each other as well. And it turns out that this is a crow, a raven, and this is a chicken. And when you look at the two skeletons, you can see, even though one's a crow, one's a chicken, the skeletons are actually really, really similar. Over here, this is Anchiornis, and this over here is Archaeopteryx, and this is Sinosauropteryx. So Anchiornis, as we'll see later, actually more than likely had uh, was capable of powered flight. Of course, Archaeopteryx was capable of powered flight as well. Uh, Sinusoropteryx was a regular theropod. All creationists agree that this critter is a dinosaur, um, although there are now groups of creationists that say these two are actually birds. And so what they want to do is they want to put uh, these two over in this group, and they want to call all of these birds. And it seems like the reason they want to do that is because uh, these two had feathers and flew. That seems to be the criteria that uh, these creationists are using in order to put them into that group. Um, and I can see maybe, maybe why they want to do that. So I've added here kind of like the lifelike uh, representations of what these critters actually look like. Uh, this is supposedly what Anchionis looked like. And by the way, the skeletons are not to scale here, okay? Um, looked something like this, and Archaeopteryx looks something like this, and Sinosauropteryx looks something like this. And you can see that these two certainly look, you know, with the skin on, they sort of look more like a crow or a chicken. They look more like birds um, than they do, uh, you know, like this figure, this crew over here. But re again, remember, these are extinct um, organisms, so we don't actually know exactly what they look like, but something like this. Uh, <clears throat> but this group of creationists are essentially saying because these had feathers and flew, we should be calling them uh, birds. And essentially, uh, these people are saying that because they're holding to uh, a, a, tax, a taxonomical classification system that's called folk taxonomy. 
Um, different cultures use this taxonomy all the time. Uh, these creatures have feathers, they flew, and so the culture will call them one thing. And that's perfectly fine from a non-scientific perspective, and it's perfectly fine for a reasonable, uh, constructive way of, uh, of putting organisms into groups. So, for example, the Bible does that. Uh, it says that uh, on day five of creation, God created winged creatures. And it's in, in, in most translations, it says birds. It's actually winged creatures. Um, and so what that means is, well, what's a winged creature? Well, that would include bats. That would include pterosaurs. That would include birds in the, in the regular sense of the word. Uh, it would also include flying theropods, if we believe, that in fact, that they're dinosaurs. And it may even include insects as well. In other words, it's a folk taxonomy that's used in Scripture. It's not a scientific taxonomy, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, God is is just trying to tell us that he has filled the skies, that he uh, He created the skies, and now he's filled the skies with these creatures. He's not trying to tell us about relationships between them. He's just trying to tell us, he's given us a folk taxonomy, and that is that these creatures all had wings and they flew. And when a creationist tries to use that taxonomy, you're going to run into all kinds of problems because, um, for example, I mean, bats and pterosaurs are called wing creatures in the Bible, but we, you know we wouldn't call them, uh, if we were using the folk taxonomy, we, we wouldn't call them birds. Um, what this group of creationists wants to do is they want to say, well, if it's got feathers and it flew, then we're going to create a taxonomy and we're going to call that taxonomy birds. And in fact, as we'll see later, um, the groups dinosaur and bird anyway, uh, actually, there's a lot of ambiguity when you start to introduce other taxa into the equation. And so it's really not that simple. But let's have a closer look at this. Um, let's go back to this slide. Uh, have a look at the skeletons of the... Uh, so here is Sinoceropteryx. Have a look at the skeleton of Sinoceropteryx and the skeleton of Archaeopteryx and Anchionis. And the reason that you grouped these three together, let me find that slide where you grouped them together, the reason that we grouped them together like that is because we can see that from a skeletal perspective, an anatomical perspective, these are more similar to each other than these. And it's pretty obvious. Uh, you have a look at the uh, vertebral column. Look at this long vertebral column. All of them have the same vertebral column. And when we talk about the vertebral column, we're talking about the real, the, the basic structure of an organism, of a vertebrate organism anyway. And you can see it's all very similar. In fact, the processes that come off each vertebra uh, are very similar as well. You have a look at the processes below these uh, um, caudal vertebra, and you can see that they're very similar to the cross, cross, cross uh, processes here, processes here, as well as the processes above the vertebra. They're all very similar. And that these um, vertebral columns are very different to what we see over here in the birds. Um, you can see there's a, a, a lot of fusion going on in a bird a vertebral column. Also it has a pica style, so, which is obviously very different. So you can see that that's a big difference. The hip structure. Now if you have a look at the hip structure, uh, you've got the ilia, um, which is right here in each of these organs. And although they're a little bit different in each one, they're more or less the same. Uh, the pubis, uh, although the pubis is a little bit different in each one, it's more or less the same. The main difference is actually that uh, the one in Archaeopteryx actually faces backwards the most, and the one in Anchionis is sort of pointing straight down and maybe facing backwards just a little bit, whilst the one in Sinoceropteryx is sort of facing forward. Um, when well, you compare these bones to the hip bones in a bird, look, this is the pubis in a, in a, in a, in a chicken, and, and the crow's the same similar how thin it is it's really thin little pubis the ischium is very flat it's very different in both organisms to these organisms uh, these three have uh, three fingered um, uh, hands so digits one two and three they're the three fingers that you see on these on these I'm just calling them dinosaurs or them I should say organisms to keep it neutral but they're the three fingers that they have on those organisms and uh, on a, on birds however, the uh, the fingers are actually fused into something called the carpometacarpus, which is the uh, uh, metacarpals are actually uh, fused together in birds. It's very different 
to uh, what we see in, in dinosaurs. Uh, so they have that similarity. Uh, obviously, the skulls, you can see the skulls are very similar to each other as well. Uh, the main differences would be in the, in the arms. You can see that these two have more similar uh, arms. Uh, the arm bones are more similar than they are in Sinoceroptrix, and I guess that would be because of these ones are flyers. Um, so you can see just from a skeletal structure why we would uh, put them in that group. Now, this is really interesting because this is what uh, one of this one of these creationists has said, and I haven't I haven't uh, referenced the person because I don't want to cause dissension. I just want to point out what I think are really important facts, and we just need to be careful uh, about what we're saying. So this person says, um, this creationist says, the presence of real feathers on a on a modern creature identifies it as a bird. Certainly, there are many extinct creatures in the fossil record, and it is not surprising that they differ in some ways from the birds at our backyard feeders. But there is no justification in considering an obviously feathered animal to be anything but a bird, other than the wish to establish an evolutionary origin for birds and feathers. Now I want you to think about that statement. There's, there's really, there's no justification in considering an obviously feathered animal to be anything but a bird. Well, hang on a minute, let's go back to these skeletons. I call this pretty good justification, all right? You have a look at those skeletons. They're really, really similar. Um, I think that's a really good justification. Um, and I, so I think that this statement by this creationist is patently untrue. It's, it's, it's not accurate. Um, there is really good justification for calling these creatures a dinosaur and not a bird. And it's got nothing to do with wanting to establish an evolutionary origin for birds and feathers. Um, it's just anatomy. When I look at the anatomy, of these three, I, I see them as being very, very similar. And so that means uh, whether they had feathers or not, I want to classify these into a group, and I want to classify that group as being different than this group. So uh, essentially that's it in a nutshell, and that's why I think uh, we don't want to be saying that dinosaurs didn't have feathers, because it really doesn't matter scripturally, and if you say that they, they, they didn't have feathers, then you get into all sorts of problems with the people that you're trying to reach. Because if you say they didn't have feathers, they want to know, what is it you're thinking? Are you thinking that the feathers, are they, are they fakes? Is the fossil a fake? What do you mean by that? Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of creationists who just listen to uh, a podcast or read a paper and say, nope, they didn't have feathers, they really don't understand what's going on in the bigger picture. So hopefully that all makes sense. Uh, I think it's okay. We can group these together in a group we call dinosaurs, uh, and uh, it's okay to say that dinosaurs had feathers, and it's okay that they flew. No reason not, not to go there. So we need to establish that to begin with. Okay, so now we come to the big question. See, this is, this is the really important question, and um, it's really important, and if you say that dinosaurs didn't have feathers, you put a wall up to begin with before you even get to the real problem. And that is, did birds evolve from dinosaurs? And of course, I'm a creationist, so I believe that they did not. But there's another more important question before we ask that question. And that is, did flying dinosaurs evolve from land-based dinosaurs? And the reason this is important is because um, in the evolutionary scheme, birds actually evolved from some kind of flying dinosaur group. So what's really important is, where did actual flight come from? What about the feathers and flight itself? That is a key question. And this is important because uh, when we look at diagrams like this that you'll find in textbooks, your, your kids are going to have these in their textbooks, they seem to imply that there's a nice sequence uh, from um, uh, these critters over here on the left, sort of basal or basic primitive uh, theropods to birds on the right. Now, this is actually uh, part of a, th a three-part series, this this, this um uh, frame comes from a part of a three-part series, and you can you can find that in the description. I put a link there to part one, so go to that series and watch those videos uh, if you want more uh, more information. So I'm just going to quickly go through that here. So here we've got in this sequence we've got Sinoceropteryx, which is considered to be a, a basic um, theropod dinosaur, so it doesn't have feathers. Some people want to say that it has kind of like a proto feather. That's debatable. Uh, the point is, 
um, I think it's okay to say it really doesn't have feathers. It might have had some kind of dino fuzz or something, but it doesn't have feathers in the way we would traditionally think of feathers. Okay, then the next one is Velociraptor in the series. So you've got Velociraptor here, you've got uh, Unanlagia Unan over here, you've got Quadipteryx, you've got, uh, this is Protoarchaeopteryx, Archaeopteryx, uh, you've got Alalevis, which is an enantoornithine, uh, birds sort of considered to be a little bit a little bit more primitive than modern birds which uh, which is displayed here as a crow at the end of the sequence so very convincing uh, diagram when you look at it now remember I said that what is important is most important is the fossils themselves where they lie in the fossil record the other thing that's important is homology in other words, when you line the fossils up, do you see changes in the fossils? Are there similarities from one fossil to the next? Do you see adaptations and exaptations being added to the group uh, as you go along? And that's homology, and we'll talk about that later because that's also pretty powerful. Right now, we just want to talk about the fossils because it's the sequence, how they lie in the fossil record that becomes, um, you know, the most important piece of data in support of Darwinian evolution. So let's have a look at the fossil record then and see what it has to say. So here is uh, our geologic column. And here's the Phanerozoic time, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, and Mesozoic's been blown up. It's conventional time, 250 to 65 million years ago. Of course, I don't believe that. I'm a creationist, but we're using those, um, those numbers. Uh, and then... Uh, this is that picture that we just looked at. It's a PBS uh, from a PBS a teaching page on online, and uh, again the groups here. Sonosauropteryx belongs in a group called Compsognathidae, so that's right down here in the blue. Notice that Compsognathidae. So 150 million years ago, and Compsognathidae no feathers. The rest of these, all of these, belong in a group called Manoraptoriformes. So Manoraptoriformes are a group of theropod dinosaurs that had feathers. If it had feathers, it's in that group. Now, um, Eoalevis and modern birds are, are in a group called Aviale, and I've removed those two from, from Manoratoriformes. So in that Manoratoriformes, you have a smaller grouping, which would include this Eoalevis and this uh, modern bird, and I've removed that. So now all I'm left with is sort of the primitive Manoratoriformes, or the theropod dinosaurs uh, that have traditionally been considered dinosaurs that have feathers. And I've put all of those families here as well. So above Consignathidae are all of the families that are in this group of theropod dinosaurs that had feathers. This is all of them, except Aviale. When you can think of Aviale, think of sort of what we traditionally think of as birds. I've removed that. And then uh, these uh, colors correspond to the colors of the groups down here. So you know the range of each of the groups. So for example, Compsognathidae starts at around 150 million years ago and goes up to sort of 100 or 110 or 20, something like that million years ago. And uh, Anchionithidae starts at 163 million years ago. And so you can kind of get the idea of uh, the range of each one of these groups. Okay, so you might want to stop the video, kind of get that into your head. Because this is really cool. This is going to this is going to blow your mind when it comes to uh, the concept of the actual evolution of the feather and fly. And this is what you want to be telling your students uh, or your kids uh, when they come home telling you that flight has evolved, that dinosaurs, uh, the birds evolved from dinosaurs, and the dinosaurs evolved the ability to fly. So the most advanced uh, Manoratora form here is Archaeopteryx. This is where, this is Archaeopteryx right here. That's the most advanced form before you get to what we would really call modern birds. Archaeopteryx was able to fly, had powered flight, it had fully developed panaceous feathers. Everything about Archaeopteryx uh, tells us this was a fully mature flyer. And all of these other uh, feathered dinosaurs that we see before here, we're told that they're the ones that sort of led up to Archaeopteryx. They're the ones that, that uh, are built into cladograms that lead up to the evolution of Archaeopteryx. 
So we would expect then to find all of these theropods below Archaeopteryx in the fossil record, right? I mean, that's what we would expect. And in fact, that's what the picture leads you to believe. But what does the fossil record actually tell us? Well, here is Archaeopteridae. So that's the family. It has two genera in it, one of, one of which is Archaeopteryx, the most important one. Um, and it's only a has a very, very short range. But notice where it starts. It starts at about 150 million years ago in the fossil record. Notice that all of these other groups, except this one here, Anchionithidae, they either start at the same time that Archaeopteryx does in the fossil record, or they appear in the fossil record above Archaeopteryx. In other words, all of these organisms here either appear at the same time as Archaeopteryx or actually after Archaeopteryx in the fossil record. I mean, even uh, Sinoceropteryx from the family uh, Compsognathidae, even it starts in the fossil record at 150 million years ago. In fact, Sinoceropteryx itself, the one that the fossil with the fuzz on it, is actually found in sediments that supposedly 125 million years ago. So it's it's sort of way up here. In the fossil record but let's not go there let's just stay with the family concept out the day um, so that starts at 150 uh, you've got truodontids starts at 150 and archaeopteridae start at 150 and that leaves only one group which is anchionithidae below archaeopteryx in the fossil record in other words the pictures that you see in the uh, textbooks are depicting a interpretation of the fossils, but they're also leading us to believe that these fossils are actually found before Archaeopteryx, and they are not. And this is very, very important. This has to do with, we're talking here about the evolution, not of birds, remember. We're talking about the evolution of the feather and the evolution of flight, which was first developed in theropods, and birds later just picked up on that flight, which was already supposedly developed. So that leaves uh, Anchionithidae. So what do we do about that then? Is that a transition? Does that work as a transition? And that's a good question. Well, uh, it used to be that uh, Anchionis was considered a non-flying uh, theropod. In other words, it was kind of like uh, some of these up to, uh, some of these other raptors, dromaeosaurs, like Velociraptor, which had feathers but wasn't able to fly. Um, now that's really interesting because I remember, you know, a couple of years ago looking at Anchionis, looking at a paper on it, and thinking, wow, it's it's a really developed. It's got a lot of really good uh, plumage. Uh, it's got fully developed uh, panaceous feathers, and uh, I don't see any reason why this thing shouldn't be able to fly. But anyway, the paleontologists were telling us that it didn't. But this paper came out in 2020. And here the authors actually suggest that more than likely um, uh, Anchionis was able to fly, powered flight, actually flapping its wings and get off the ground. And that's really interesting because a couple of years ago, I remember reading in an article, um, someone in that article was, was, was looking at Anchionis and thinking, wow, I'm so glad we have Anchionis because it's a link. It gives me a link from Sinoceropteryx to Archaeopteryx. In other words, you go Sinoceropteryx, no flight, no feathers. Archaeopteryx, fully matured flight. And I'm so thankful for Anchionis because it's kind of like a link. Well, now it's a different situation because it turns out, um, and they've put, you can see here, Anchionis and Archaeopteryx as sister taxa on this particular cladogram. Now it turns out that uh, Anchionis may have been able to, and uh, fully equipped with the ability for powered flight. If that's the case, then uh, it is well below the group from which it supposedly evolved, which is this group, Compsognathidae. It's around 150 million years ago. But uh, Anchionithidae starts around 163 million years ago. And that's over 10 million years before in the fossil record. And what's really interesting is the before uh, Anchionithidae or Anchionis there is not a single feather in the fossil record, not a single panaceous feather in the fossil record. Zero, not, not even one. There are no feathered theropods. And of course, that is amazing given this diagram here that you see in textbooks. 
And this is what you want to be telling your kids. Essentially, there is no fossil evidence, sequential evidence, before uh, Anchionis, and apart from Archaeopteryx, there's only Anchionis in the fossil record. This is really cool stuff because it supports a creationist uh, interpretation. It's what a creationist would predict. Okay, now, there are still some, some questions that we need to ask because uh, although there are no, uh, uh, really, well, there's none, there's not a single feather uh, before Anchionis in the fossil record, we still need to ask the question, well, what do we do with these sort of in-betweens? Yes, they do appear in the wrong place. Uh, they do appear after Archaeopteryx in the fossil record. But when you look at the sequence of their arms, so here's their arms here, and you can see you've got Sinusoroptrix with no feathers, and you've got Velociraptor with a few feathers, you've got uh, Unalegia with sort of a, a, a small plumage, and then you've got Archaeopteryx with a full plumage, the full ability to fly, and these two, by the way, these two represent what we would traditionally call birds. Um, you've got Archaeopteryx here with full flight. So you do see sort of a sequence, right? And so how do we explain that? Well, uh, a number of evolutionary scientists are thinking in terms of the secondary loss of flight in a lot of these uh, feathered dinosaurs that didn't fly. Uh, this uh, Now, first of all, uh, this guy here, Fiducia, Alan Fiducia, uh, he uh, is quoted a lot in creationist circles because he really, really does not like the dino to bird uh, evolutionary hypothesis. That's not to say he doesn't believe in the evolution of birds. He just believes that birds bypass dinosaurs altogether and they evolved from some ancient uh, archosaur. And uh, we just don't have a record for it. Uh, but he doesn't think that they evolved from dinosaurs at all. And so he thinks that all of these uh, sort of in-betweens are, uh, uh, are actually birds that secondarily lost their flight, which is really interesting. Uh, and it's not just him. Now, he's actually disliked in the paleontology community. They really, really don't like him. In fact, uh, apart from creationists, he's the second most disliked person. And his, his little band is the second most disliked community, apart from creationists, uh, because of his hypothesis. But there are others. Uh, this guy here, Gregory Paul, did believe that uh, birds, or does believe that birds evolved from theropod dinosaurs. However, he's starting to think in terms of the secondary loss of flight for a lot of these uh, theropods, uh, these sort of flightless theropods as well. So, if that's the case, if in fact, we we'll go back to this picture, these represent secondarily uh, 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 theropods that have secondarily lost their flight, then that means there is no fossil evidence for the evolution of flight of all. And there's no reason for us not to think in terms of secondary loss of flight. Birds do that today. You look at a bird and its its little wings are diminished. It's, it's sometimes its feathers are really, really small or even gone. Um, and so we can see that. And if you found that in the fossil record uh, and you found it in the fossil record before a flighted organism, you might hypothesize that it's in the process of evolution, right? Well, since we find these, after Archaeopteryx, maybe uh, these are actually, uh, uh, um, uh, maybe there are adaptations that are uh, because of a secondary loss of flight. Anyway, it's a hypothesis. It's one that the evolutionary community are using, and it's one that you can use as well, uh, since it has uh, it, it has a, a, some some uh, substantiality to it. Now, by the way, it may turn out that they're not secondarily flightless, and that God just created uh, a a a, a, a uh, feathered dinosaur without the ability to fly. That's possible. Now, I personally don't like that because it turns out that, as far as I know, all of the uh, feathered dinosaurs that have feathers, for sure, 100% uh, panaceous feathers, they also have a semilunate carpal bone, both of which are essential for flight. And yes, I know that, ev uh, that evolutionists have said, well, you can have feathers for protecting against the sun and you can have it for warmth and things like that. But, you know, panaceous feathers uh, seem like they're really developed to fly. I mean, it seems like that, the semicarpal bone and some of the other uh, adaptations used in flight seem like they're actually designed for flight. And so it just seems unusual to me that you'd have these things on organisms that actually don't fly. Although it's possible. I don't know.
some thoughts. Okay, so in summary then, uh, flying theropod dinosaurs, they did exist. We are saying that uh, theropod dinosaurs existed with feathers, but there are no fossil, there's no fossil record for the evolution of flight in these theropods. They just sort of appear in the fossil record with no transitions for flight. So that's the summary so far. However, we still have to answer the question about the evolution of birds, right? That, that's the next question that we want to answer, but we're going to have to wait and uh, put that in part two because we're already at sort of 40 minutes here. So pretty exciting stuff. Please come back for part two. Um, uh, as always, uh, I would ask that you go to my website. I've got extra resources there. Whenever I do a video, uh, I put the uh, scripted ver version on my website, but it's a lot longer. I include a lot more information, more references and things like that. It's a lot more in-depth. So if you want more in-depth information on a video, go to my website. You'll find a more in-depth discussion on a particular video topic. The video topic is always a lot shorter. Uh, also, uh, there's uh, other YouTube videos as well. Please share these with your friends. Share them wherever you can. Uh, like this video if you thought that uh, what you would listen to today was helpful. If you can really help uh, your students or your kids with this stuff, then uh, please like the video, uh, subscribe, and of course, donate. Uh, I'm trying to move away from work. I need to get paid. So if you could donate, there's a there's a, a button in the description as well as on the channel as well. It'd be great. Um, as always, uh, please pray for me. I absolutely need prayer. Uh, this is essential. Uh, I do feel the weight uh, of this ministry. Uh, I, I'm sort of getting a, a bit a bit of attacked from I get attacked obviously from evolutionists, naturalists, but I also get attacked from creationists um, because uh, I don't know. I just tend to be very thoughtful about the data, uh, critical about the data, and oftentimes that means uh, sort of contradicting what other creations have said, uh, although I'm trying to do it very politely, but um, that, that, that does mean uh, that, that, that people don't like that. So kind of in a bit of a bind there, uh, really looking for people who are critical thinkers. If you're a critical thinker, you, you believe in Christ, uh, and you believe the scriptures, and you don't just want to believe just just because it was your faith of your parents, you want this. To, you want to know this is true. Then this is the channel for you because that's what we're about. We're about showing that the word of God is faithful by looking at the scientific evidence. And of course, as always, I always say this. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's not about the evidence. Um, it's about a conviction to b obey and believe what the Scripture says, what God has says has said in His Word by faith. And it wouldn't matter if there was no evidence whatsoever. There's enough evidence in the scriptures themselves to convince us that God is true, Christ is the Savior, and that we need redemption, forgiveness of sins. Okay, so uh, that is today. We will see you with part two shortly. Thanks, bye.